The first scene we included is a salute to the competency and professionalism of the engineering support and launch control team at the Kennedy Space Center. On March 22nd, we made our first launch attempt, but due to a leaky valve, the right engine didn't come up to full thrust, and that shut down, as you can see in the film. The other two engines shut down, and the calm and coolness of the launch control team led to safing the vehicle and expediting the egress uh, from the vehicle at that point. Well, we put the delay to good use and focused a little tighter on our mission and the objectives and got a second shot at it a month later. Beautiful weather, on-time launch. Here you see three good engines coming up to full power for six seconds. Signals the boosters to light. And uh, at the liftoff, uh, we got seven million pounds of thrust pushing five million pounds of vehicle into orbit. And the experience of a launch is spectacular. It really is something. We had uh, trouble-free ascent all the way to orbit, and uh, here in first stage, you'll see us penetrating a little bit of cloud layer that was very, very thin and uh, not a problem for us at all. But uh, what you'll see as we approach the region of maximum dynamic pressure here, uh, the vapors form around the nose cones of the uh, solid rocket boosters in the orbiter itself. Then as uh, uh, we get to about the two-minute point in the ascent, the solid rocket boosters uh, burn out and separate, and we get a bright flash of orange <coughs> across the windscreen that we can see from the cockpit as the boosters separate. Another six minutes, we're in orbit. Shortly after getting into orbit, I uh, launched downstairs. I was, uh, very quickly got out of my seat to come upstairs to do some engineering photo documentation of the external tank. The tank looked like it had fared the launch in good shape, and uh, we got some excellent photographic documentation for the engineers here on the ground. After the doors were open, we had our first opportunity to look at our home for the next uh, 10 days. You see the space lab there in the orbiter's payload bay. And you also see us now coming into the space lab through the tunnel that connects between the orbiter's mid-deck and the space lab. Within uh, about three and a half hours, four hours after we got onto orbit, we were already starting to activate the laboratory. And here's a view from the aft end cone camera as I'm activating the systems. And uh, Dr. Volter's coming in to assist me in that project. We were uh, very busy on orbit. We had 88 experiments to conduct, and while we did work on two different shifts of 12 hours each, there were periods of time when all four of the payload crew members were in the laboratory conducting experiments, and this gives you an impression of the very busy schedule that we had uh, conducting all those experiments. Out of the uh, 88 experiments that we had on board, 40% of it involved human studies and human physiology. Uh, here you see me uh, doing an echo on myself, and that allows me to image the heart so we can determine uh, heart function and volume. Uh, we also did a number of other tests uh, included in that were saline infusion. You might have read about that in, in the papers that we infused up to a liter or so of fluid in our bodies. It was ma mainly as a test and not as a uh, operational replacement of the fluid that we lost going in, uh, into space. Well, in order to keep uh, the blood from coagulation, uh, Bernard is uh, now putting me a small amount of saline liquid into the catheter. And uh, after that, it will be a centrifuge in a centrifuge, which is currently done by Jerry, which takes about 10 minutes. And the <coughs> blood plasma is separated from the, from the rest of the blood. And after that, it's put in the mid-deck uh, for uh, cooling down to very low temperatures. Also, the metabolism of the body is changing in uh, weightlessness. So here, a mass spectrometer analyzes the breadth of Jerry's uh, exhalation gases in order to figure out what the difference is between micro-G and ground. Here, I measure the uh, thickness and compliance on the skin of my forehead. And uh, micro-G makes a fluid shift to the upper body. Where does the fluid go? Does it go into the skin, and if into the skin, into the cells or between the cells? Everything else in space changes too, and especially the effectiveness of our metabolism and of our lung. We investigate that by doing several different breathing maneuvers <laughs> under rest and under uh, a defined workload, like here on an ergometer. Here you see uh, Charlie Precourt uh, uh, conducting an experiment called barrel reflex. And it's actually a way in which we can apply positive and negative pressure to the neck, and that uh, causes the heart to react in a certain way. 
And actually, we study the reflexes of the heart, the ability to increase the heart rate and, and decrease the heart rate in terms of response. We also had a number of biological experiments on board. Uh, here you see me uh, conducting one of those experiments in a foldable hand handling box. Uh, this allows us to fill uh, chambers with electrolyte fluid without the <coughs> fluid escaping into the, to, into the cabin, so it helps us to contain that. Uh, the next scene here is showing you one of those growth chambers, uh, which are plant roots. And as you can see here, we had to show this to the ground uh, during several times during the flight. You can see a number of the roots, how they grow either upward or horizontally, and that, that really is dependent on gravity. And so you kind of see that, and we made uh, measurements of that. Here you see the swimming pattern of young pattern of young and fish. And during the mission, we observe how that behavior changes. And then we take these species down to Earth and look at the individual changes of their vestibular organ and the neurological changes. After taking pictures of these uh, young and healthy mushrooms, uh, we, at different times, we take samples, fix them, and take them down <laughs> to ground. So further analysis can be done by different kinds of microscopy. Well, one of the major objectives of the biological experiment was the fusion of cells in order to combine two traits of different plants into one cell. And here you see the alignment of these cells in an electric field. A pulse, a high pulse of electric fields will make the cell fuse. And you see two of these cells fused on the left up corner of the picture. And after that, the uh, cells are fixated and put at very low temperature, about minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And you see Bernard putting it into this uh, liquid nitrogen to keep it cool uh, for further analysis on ground. This is the robot technology experiment. Uh, we have two different cameras, one in the grip of the robot arm and one as seen here in the work cell. We, uh, look at these pictures on a TV monitor via glasses to have a stereo image. And uh, we're doing different tasks. The most sophisticated one is, which is shown here, catching of a free-floating part. We had a total of seven different types of furnaces on board in two different facilities. We would use those to melt around three dozen different samples of various compositions. And then we would re allow those samples to re-solidify. And what we're really trying to study is the basic physics of what's happening when those uh, melts re-solidify, and also then to bring those samples back down to the ground and understand the physical properties after those samples have been processed. The next view, you'll see uh, us looking internal to that furnace that Hans is working on there. This is after the furnace has already been heated up to the point where the uh, sample was melting. And it allowed us to judge the sample and to alter the process as we were watching the melt in real time. This is a fluid physics module. Only under micro G, we are able to grow big self containing uh, liquid columns. And we are looking for their stability, their resonances and for different patterns of internal flow. What you see here is the growth of one of these liquid columns uh, in a time-compressed way. And here we see some oscillation. Here yeah, I'm preparing for another fluid physics experiment at a higher frequency of the column in order to run through the resonances here in the microgravity uh, environment. We're also going to the limit of the breakage of the column, which is called the Rayleigh limit. And you see it happening right now, where you get to the limit where the column breaks into parts. This is a, a picture of another facility that was used to study fluid physics called a holographic uh, laboratory, which we use a hologram to document the current flow. You the current flow. You theory it's called Marangoni currents, and basically studies surface tension versus temperature of fluids. Take a look outside the module now. It's some remotely mounted instruments, the shuttle amateur radio antenna, the Gauss camera for studying the Milky Way, 
in the MOMS camera, you see here the stereoscopic mapping of the Earth. We also had a gas can out there for some material science and an atomic oxygen exposure tray. The only significant anomaly we had on the mission uh, pertaining to the orbiter was a small hole that developed in our wastewater tank, which was leaking nitrogen. You can see the hole at the end of the pen. We were able to uh, coordinate an effort with the ground, enabling us to cap off the uh, nitrogen flow to that tank and then connect our wastewater flow to a contingency waste container, essentially a canvas bag. And that enabled us to stay on the, on the orbit for at least, uh, or in orbit for at least another six days. However, to uh, stay for the full duration, we needed to be able to dump the contents of that bag, and that's what you see here. And this is the flow out the window, the ice crystals uh, forming in space. And that was successful and enabled us to stay up for the full duration. We had several major press events during the mission, and uh, one of which you see here was a 30-minute one uh, with questions answered to reporters uh, back into Germany and Europe, uh, coordinated with the GSOC, or the German uh, Control Center. We also flew a, a SAR-X, or an amateur radio, on board. Here you see me talking on that radio. And we conducted uh, at least, I believe, 14 contacts with schools, answering the questions of school children. Another thing we did with the SAR-X was to conduct a test comparing the two antennas, the standard orbiter SAR-X antenna with that SAFEX antenna I showed you on the module a minute ago. And that was uh, what turned out to be a very successful test for the SAR-X program. Here's to give you a view of what it's like in our sleeping arrangements. I'm waking up the blue shift to get them started on another day uh, work in the lab. And uh, we uh, get them roused up. And at the same time, the red shift's preparing dinner to get ready to go to bed. We've got Steve here shaving, getting ready for breakfast. It's a busy time when we have crew handover. And, uh, and yet it's one of the few times, because of our busy schedule, that we can get together for dinner and uh, talk about the events of the day and do a little bit of filming of our eating habits. Exercise is important on orbit, just as it is here in uh, 1G. And the next scene is uh, myself riding the ergometer on the flight deck in support of a medical experiment to determine the benefits of intense exercise the day before landing. You don't get away from paperwork, even in space. And we had our own fax machine, and we were uplinked to uh, over 230 messages which when c cut into separate pages constitute over 600 pieces of paper, and we read all of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a very small pocket experiment where I experienced the uh, amount of uh, the magnetic field, earth magnetic field, even in space. I put a small magnet which will interact with the earth magnetic field and uh, start to oscillate in that field. Well, this scene probably needs to be put to music rather than my narration. <coughs> And uh, it was on our last day before closing up the lab that we had a little bit of time to experience zero-G aerobatics. And about all I can say here is that zero-G is a delightful place to live. <laughs> well, we hoped that our uh, photography would uh, be more spectacular than Charlie's dancing. And to support that, we had over 20 cameras uh, using six different formats. We captured over 6,500 still frames and literally days of video. The next scene uh, is crossing the Persian Gulf, looking uh, down the Gulf in a south uh, easterly direction around the Strait of Hormuz into the Gulf of Oman. And we uh, passed this area daily and caught some uh, spectacular still photographs as well as movies. And every morning as the red shift came on duty, this is what was passing under us on the Earth, the Himalayas. You can see in the foreground there the snow-capped mountains. And uh, just coming into view on the far right side of the screen now is Mount Everest. And uh, that was a really incredible way to start your day. For a micro-G laboratory, it's important to know how micro-G disturbances propagate through the lab and appear at uh, different sites. And so what we did, we applied micro-G disturbance by hammer blows, very well-defined ones, and looked at different places with fences, uh, how high or how big the G jitter really was. On the day before entry, uh, we checked out every primary reaction control jet by firing them. And here you see some of the tail jets uh, being fired. And after that, uh, we got into the flight control system checkout, in which we checked out basically the entire flight control system, all the sensors, uh, 
nav aids and displays. And I think it's uh, worthy of note on an airplane as complex as the Columbia is, we had absolutely no anomalies in any of these tests at all. Once the checkout was done, it was my job to deactivate the payload and also the space lab. And uh, you see me here closing the airlock to the space lab in preparation for deorbit prep. Once the work in the lab was uh, finished, we had a few moments to reflect upon the mission and the successes uh, that we hope to achieve later on the ground with the data. We were also able to uh, try and capture some of the beauty of space flight, and this is a real-time sunset, and they were spectacular on this mission as well as the moon rises and sets. And with a uh, successful laboratory <coughs> mission behind us, it was time to get suited up, strapped into seats, and get ready to come home. As, of course, as you're aware, we waved <coughs> off to the Kennedy for weather and ended up going to Edwards. And Jerry was able to capture some of the glow from the plasma of heat of reentry around the orbiter as we came in on the night side. Uh, but we were approaching a sunrise, and you'll see here in a moment uh, Tom's window on the right-hand side of the vehicle uh, is orange right there while the sun is rising through Steve's window. Really spectacular. Uh, of course, we uh, diverted into Edwards after getting uh, an extra day and an extra orbit out of this mission, and we flew uh, to a left-hand turn, about a 180 or 190 degree turn left uh, to runway 22 at Edwards. We flew down a, a 17 degree glide path at 300 knots to about 2,000 feet, then flared onto a shallow glide path. Tom lowered the landing gear at about 300 feet, and we continued to decelerate uh, and descend and touch down about 2,000 feet down the runway. Uh, from the point of touchdown until where we uh, lowered the nose, uh, you've got some slowing down to do down to 175 knots. So the, the nose stayed in the air for a little while, and then when we derotated or lowered the nose, Tom deployed the drag chute. And uh, my perception, I think everybody's perception was, we didn't really feel the drag chute come out in its reefed configuration, like you see right here. But when it disreefed or fully opened, we felt a good strong tug at a deceleration. And from that point, uh, we just applied uh, light to moderate braking and rolled to a stop. We uh, used about almost 12,000 feet of the runway, but could have stopped a lot shorter. The drag chute is jettisoned at 60 knots so, uh, so that the risers won't lay over the, the engine bells of the main engines when you come completely to a stop. And this uh, signified the ending of uh, what we consider to be a, a very successful mission. And I'm very thankful, as I said before, uh, uh, to have had the privilege of flying on this mission, to have worked uh, both with uh, you know, our American friends and our German friends. And uh, we all have a sense of, uh, of fulfillment, of fulfillment, thanking me for getting them back on the ground, I guess. <laughs> but uh, we all have a sense of fulfillment from this mission uh, of having participated in something that was meaningful, that was uh, accomplished only with a lot of hard work.